was a big shock to me when I got the death penalty. I was scared. Over 50 women are currently imprisoned on America's death row. So many of these cases are horrible crimes. How did this person come to do an act so violent? They were wives, mothers, young women with their whole lives ahead of them. So how did they end up on death row? She was seen as evil. People said she was evil. She was an active participant in this horrific murder. We examine the crimes of seven American women who were condemned to die. She cold-bloodedly murdered her own son. These people were kidnapped and buried alive. Nadine Smith told her, you will die a slow death. And we discover what happened to them. She apologized to the families of the victims. Some escaped the death chamber. I came two days away from my execution. I had a fear of being strapped to that gurney. Others were not so lucky. In one year, the three women on death row were all executed. It was a terrifically cruel crime. I think justice was done. I've never wanted to die. I lost everything I ever cared about. Everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me. If I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. Women make up only a small fraction of the total death row population in America today, less than 2%. From the early 70s, we've had almost 1,200 men executed and only 11 women. There's a general reluctance by juries to execute women. The thought of killing a woman, I think, is just not as palatable or as acceptable. But occasionally, juries do impose the ultimate punishment on female killers. Women are typically viewed as nurturers. If they commit a violent crime that takes away from that identity or public perception, they may look more terrible or monstrous than a man. As a prosecutor, the goal is to try to convince the jury that the gender is not relevant. What's relevant is the facts and the law. A capital murder is a killing plus some other factors that make it worse. Killing two or three people, killing them through a torture, killing them during a robbery or a rape or a kidnapping. In some cases, geography determines the difference between a life sentence and a death sentence. State to state, it's going to be handled quite differently, and quite frankly, even from prosecutor to prosecutor. In the modern era, the states that have executed the most women are Oklahoma, Florida, and Texas. Texas has been the death penalty capital of the United States for a long time. It was in Houston, Texas, that a brutal double murder put one woman on death row for almost 20 years. On the night of the 3rd of March, 1980, a frantic young woman flagged down a police car and confessed to murder. I just wanted to admit to the crime. Pam said, me and Mike killed two bobs in Houston. She signed a 26-page confession. And I read how graphic her confession was. A hair on my neck stood up. 24-year-old Pam Perillo was one of three hitchhikers involved in the robbery and murder of two men. Mike held one end of the rope and told me to take the other end. The facts of the case were just so brutal. The state of Texas said she should die for her crimes. My confession is what got me the death penalty. What drove this young woman to commit such shocking acts of violence and then to confess? This case would never have been solved if Pam had not given a confession. Pamela Lynn Perillo was born in 1955 and grew up near Los Angeles. She remembers a deprived childhood that was scarred by abuse. My mother used to whip us with um, curtain rods and extension cords. My father started drinking and molesting me and my older sister. She'd been in like eight foster homes. Started using drugs when she was not even a teenager. Eventually, Pam dropped out of school and took to the streets. I used heroin every day. Did whatever we had to do to get the money. A lot of burglaries. Pam fell pregnant age 22 
and gave birth to a son, but continued her self-destructive lifestyle. I was working as a topless dancer. When she was 24, Pam met Linda and Michael Briddle. Mike had been an inmate in San Quentin. News media claimed he was one of the most evil people that had ever lived. He was just one of those guys who enjoyed being a crook. Linda had met and married Mike while he was in prison. Mike was out on parole in early 1980 when the couple befriended Pam. Within weeks, Mike Brittle had robbed one of Pam's customers at a topless bar. I was with Mike and another man when it happened. Mike and Linda fled to Arizona to avoid arrest. They phoned and invited Pam to join them. The police was looking for us, and so I agreed to go. The three all got together, and they were basically hitchhiking across the country. We were all pretty much heroin addicts. Speed, PCP, all kinds of pills. The trio ended up in Houston, where they eventually met 30-year-old Robert Banks. Bob Banks had just moved to Houston. He happened to notice three hitchhikers on the 610 freeway. He asked us if we would help him move. Robert Banks let the three hitchhikers stay, even taking them out to a rodeo the following night. Every time he paid for something, he paid with a $100 bill. Riddle remarked at the rodeo, we got a pigeon here. We all started discussing that we were going to rob him. After the rodeo, a friend of Banks, 26-year-old Bob Skeens, turned up at the house. Bob Skeens arrived to help him finish his move, and they all kind of hang out together that night. The next morning, Banks and Skeens went out to get some coffee and some donuts. According to Pam, Mike decided to ambush the men when they returned with breakfast. Mike was in the closet, and when they came back, Mike came out and had a rifle, told him to lay down on the floor. Banks didn't want to, and Mike hit him with the butt end of the rifle. Mike told Linda and I to go to the garage and find some rope. He had me and Linda tie Banks up. Then we took Bob Skeens to the other bedroom and tied him up. And they started ransacking the house, looking for things to steal. The plan was take the money and leave. But Mike said that we couldn't leave them alive because they had seen us. The court records tell two different versions of what happened next. And they decided to kill these two guys. They set Linda out to sit outside in the car. Mike put the rope around Robert Banks' neck. Mike gets on one end of the rope, and Pam gets on the other, and they simply pull on it till he dies. But Pam alleges that Linda was inside the house during the murders. Linda was in the back bedroom with Skeens. Mike put the rope around Banks' neck. He said, y'all are going to be a part of this, too. He told me to take the other end and pull. And then he called Linda out there and had her do the same. When you choke somebody to death, they don't die within a minute or two minutes. It takes about seven minutes for someone to die. Bob Skeens could hear Bob Banks being killed and knew he was going to be next. After Banks was murdered, Pam says that Mike told Linda to pack the car. Pam stayed with Mike. When they get through killing them, they decide to eat the donuts and coffee the two guys had brought. The three killers drove Bob Skeen's car to Dallas, then caught a bus to Denver. There, they pawned items stolen from Robert Banks' house. I couldn't believe that what happened had just happened. Mike told me that he would never let me out of his sight after what we did. He threatened to kill me. On the 3rd of March, one week after the murders, Pam says she crept out while Mike was sleeping to call the police. As I was on the phone, Mike came out of the room. He tried to hit me over my head. She ran outside, flagged down a police car. Pam said me and Mike killed two bobs in Houston. I'm admitting to my part in all of this. She gave a 26-page graphic written confession admitting everything. The police kept Pam in custody and arrested Mike and Linda Brittle. The three suspects were sent back to Texas to face trial. That was a time in Texas when they were cranking out death penalties left and right. In Houston, we had a rising tide of murders. Presented with her 26-page confession, the jury convicted Pam Perillo. 
My confession is what got me the death penalty. I was very young. I was scared. Linda Briddle never confessed to being part of the murders, and Pam's written confession didn't implicate her. Linda hit the jackpot on that one. She should have at least gotten some years in the penitentiary. Michael Briddle went on trial in 1982. Linda's testimony against him sealed his fate. Pam Perillo spent three years on death row before a legal technicality saw her sentence reversed. She stood trial for a second time in October 1984. Robert Pelton was assigned to defend her. When I met her, she was a frightened woman. She had already been sentenced to death once. She just felt real guilty. And she didn't, didn't have much of a desire to live. Jim Skelton, Linda's former lawyer, was brought in to help with the case. In the first trial, they didn't bring anything out about her background. She had been abused as a child. There's no excuse for killing two people, but it explained it all. The prosecution compelled Linda Briddle to give evidence against Pam. Linda was turning state evidence on me and claiming not to even be in the house. She kept lying. Also damaging to Pam's defense were the crime scene photos. What happened to those two bobs was tragic. The photographs were something you couldn't even imagine. Pam's lawyer claimed Mike Brittle was the ringleader. Mike Brittle, he was a horrible human being. We wanted to paint a picture how Mike Brittle could take a middle-class girl like Linda to do all these things, and how much more easily it'd be to take someone like Pam who came from a tragic background. I always thought that Pam and Mike were kind of co-equal. You know, when the death penalty came back, I just really felt kind of sorry for her. She probably did deserve the death penalty. It was a really sad situation. Perillo was sent back to death row. She was twice scheduled to be executed. I didn't have a fear of death, but I had a fear of being strapped to that gurney. I kept going over my mind what I was going to say to the victim's families at my execution. Both times, she was granted a stay of execution. I came two days from my execution. I was walking into the visiting room to say goodbye to my family. The phone rang. It was my attorneys, and they said, the Fifth Circuit has just given you a stay. I was jumping up and down. The officer, she was jumping up and down with me. But a fellow death row inmate was not so lucky. Carla Faye Tucker was my best friend for many, many years. We grew up on death row together. I learned what it was like to have a real sister. Tucker was executed in February 1998. I got very angry at God when they executed Carla, and I threw my Bible away. I had to realize it wasn't God that took Carla. She was ready to meet him. I miss her a lot. In 1999, a court of appeal again reversed Pam's death sentence. It was like this weight was just lifted off of me. They claim I had a conflict of interest because I had represented Linda in an earlier trial and took her on as a witness in Pam's trial. Perillo chose not to stand trial again. My son told me, Mom, please don't take that chance again. Instead, she accepted a life sentence with the possibility of parole. Pam was finally off death row. I went 20 years on death row without being able to touch my son because death row inmates visit behind glass. Now I'm able to hold my grandbaby. I've grown up a lot in here. I just want my life to mean something, that my experiences would deter somebody in another direction. She'll never be able to make up for what she did, but she's trying to help people now. What we did was wrong. It's not anything that goes away or that I ever stop thinking about. I'll never be able to give back what I took, and I pay for that every day. When Women on Death Row continues... Rex Carnley was brutally murdered. How young is too young to be executed? I had just turned 18. And later, 
we began to receive word that all three would be executed. How young is too young to be executed? For a long period of time, there was no line between uh, a, a juvenile and adult for the death penalty. The youngest American woman to get a death sentence in recent years was Paula Cooper in Indiana. Paula Cooper killed a nice little old lady down the street. She was 15 at the time of the crime, 16 when sentenced to death. Studies show that the most dangerous people in our society are the youngest people. They're immature, they're easily influenced by their peers, they don't have a set identity. Paula Cooper's death sentence was eventually overturned because of her age. In Alabama, a young woman called Deborah Bracewell was not much older when she was sent to death row in 1978. Deborah Bracewell was only 17 at the time of the crime. I was young and I didn't know the law and didn't know nothing about anything. Aged just 18, Deborah was sentenced to die by electric chair. I remember the judge told me about to stand up and then he sentenced me to death. She was the only woman on Alabama's death row at the time. Women being sentenced to death is unusual. Girls being sentenced to death is just almost unheard of. I was in a single cell. Nobody talked to me. I was locked behind four locked doors. What manner of crime could compel a jury to send a teenager to death row? This was a heinous crime of murder. Whoever committed this crime was a cold-blooded killer. They not only fired point blank into the head of Rex Carnley, they fired multiple times after that. Early one summer morning in 1977, the body of 43-year-old Rex Carnley was found lying in a pool of blood at the petrol station and grocery shop he owned in rural Alabama. Three months passed. Then on the 2nd of November, 27-year-old Charles Bracewell and his wife, 17-year-old Deborah, were taken into custody on unrelated theft charges. Investigators also had reason to believe that the two were involved in the murder of Rex Carnley. A friend of the Bracewells uh, testified that Charles Bracewell said that because Mr. Carnley had been killed, they needed to get out of town quick. That's just a very incriminating statement. The police interrogated Charles and Deborah regularly while they were in prison. They questioned me like 15 times a day. I told them over and over and over I didn't kill anyone. After three months, Charles confessed to the murder. Then the detectives obtained a confession from Deborah as well. I told the sheriff I did not kill Rex Carter, and then he said, did you help Charles Bracewell kill Rex Carter? And I told him no. He said, well, Charles said you did. When she was interrogated by the police, she didn't have an attorney present. She was only 17 and mentally borderline retarded. Eventually, the police secured a signed confession from the 17-year-old. They took a oral statement from her, and then they reduced that to writing and had her sign that statement. Deborah Bracewell and her husband, Charles, went to Rex Carnley's store to rob Carnley. According to Charles and Deborah's written confessions, Rex Carnley had let the couple into his shop. Once inside, Charles produced a gun and demanded money. Deborah's statement said she grabbed Carnley's 22-gauge pistol from behind the shop counter, climbed onto a stool, and shot Rex Carnley in the back of the head. Charles then shot him eight more times in the face and head. Rex Carnley was brutally murdered during the course of a robbery when his billfold and $1,200 was taken. Deborah and her husband were both charged with the capital offense of an intentional killing during the course of a robbery. While Deborah awaited her trial in jail, her parents didn't visit. Didn't understand why my parents wasn't coming to see me. I really felt lost and Deborah says she had a very difficult childhood. I didn't have the best parent in the world, but I, I, the way I see it, they did the best they could with me. She was always smiling, sweet, and real shy. At the age of 13, her parents forced her to leave school to take care of her siblings. 
the childhood I had was not good at all. She was exposed to a lot of different things that shouldn't have been going on. There was abuse. Daddy used my mother as a prostitute, and I had to see all the other men come to the house, and I didn't like what I was seeing, so I stayed to myself. Desperate for a way out, the teenager ran away with an older man, Charles Bracewell. I had just turned 17, and he was nine years older than me. I wasn't attracted to him at all. I took him as an escape to get away from the house. Deborah claims she knew nothing about Charles's criminal activities. He would go places, but I never asked questions. But the young woman found herself on trial for capital murder just days after her 18th birthday. They had no other evidence, really, beside that confession. Without that confession, they would never had a case against me. Deborah denied knowingly signing the confession that was the key evidence against her. And they said, Deborah, won't you sign these papers? These is your release papers. I was so happy about getting out of that jail. I just thought I could trust the detectives, so I just signed the papers. She didn't start telling the story until the 1990s, 10 to 15 years after the crime. To confuse that with the release statement is far-fetched in my mind. She gave details of how it happened, what happened. Then you have a consistent confession from her husband. The confession had a tremendous weight in this case. I remember the judge. He asked me, did I have anything to say before he passed the verdict? And I told him, yes, I do. I would like to say I'm innocent. Then he sentenced me to death. I really didn't know what to think. I had just turned 18. I found out that she got the penalty from the family and from the papers. It was a terrible feeling. Back then, I was the only lady on death row. It wasn't a good feeling at all. It was tough. <laughs> the question about what is appropriate as far as an age to be sentenced to death is an interesting one. Today, the law is that a 17-year-old would not be put to death. The United States Supreme Court says anyone under age 18 should not be executed. There are cases in which kids do terrible kinds of things and probably deserve the death penalty. Nonetheless, the court has said they are not fully responsible for their behavior and therefore should not have full punishment. In 1981, Deborah's life was spared when the Alabama Supreme Court granted her a new trial because she'd been interrogated without a lawyer aged just 17. It all centered around the court's viewing of that confession. And her age at the time. Her case was reversed. I was retried, and I was found guilty again. Instead of them giving me the death penalty, they gave me life without parole. Deborah has spent over 30 years in prison for a crime she committed as a teenager. It was real lonesome. I look forward to having Christmases on the outside. I do feel that Deborah serves her time. I think she needs to have a little life of her own. Alabama society has said that she has not paid her debt. Will 32 years in prison make up for someone's life? I have to say no. It's an individual question based on what you believe is right and what you believe is wrong and what you believe is just. They do lock innocent people up. So I'm a living testimony of that. I was a 17 year old in jail, uneducated. They took better than me, that hurts. Deborah has turned to religion as a means of coping with living the rest of her life behind bars. Even though I'm in prison, it didn't turn out bad. I'm free on the inside, and that's what really counts, what you are on the inside. In 2001, 
Oklahoma carried out more executions than any other U.S. state. Oklahoma is the most conservative state in the Union. We are a law and order state. There's a very low tolerance for crime, very much a sense of biblical justice. At the time, three women were on Oklahoma's death row. 61-year-old Nadine Smith, 40-year-old Marilyn Plants, and 41-year-old Wanda Jean Allen. They had all been condemned for crimes that shocked the community. Nadine Smith told her, you will die a slow death. Marilyn decided they were going to kill him tonight. Wanda Jean Allen had killed before, so this was not the first time. After years on death row, the women had exhausted their appeals. Execution dates were set and death warrants signed. It was a big deal because Oklahoma was about to execute its first woman. Public opinion was fiercely divided. We have the death penalty to uphold the value of life. It was justice that had to be carried out. It's an act of first-degree murder by the state as a punishment for first-degree murder by the perpetrator. For life for a life. And that was the only justice equitable to the crime that was committed. Condemned to die by lethal injection, the three women on Oklahoma's death row had one last chance to appeal for clemency. Lois Nadine Smith came from humble beginnings. She was a preacher's daughter from rural Oklahoma. But as she grew up, she developed a hard reputation. Miss Smith was well known in the county as, as mean Nadine. You know, she was meaner than any man. A lot of people feared her. Nobody would mess with her, and she would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any person and duke it out if she had to. By the age of 41, Nadine Smith was a divorced mother of three, living a life far removed from her religious upbringing. She abused substances. She could party for days. Her 18-year-old son, Greg Smith, also partied hard, and the police suspected he was involved with illegal drugs. Greg had been dating 21-year-old Cindy Bailey, but they'd recently split up. On the morning of the 4th of July, 1982, Nadine and her son Greg set out to confront his former girlfriend. She possibly was turning state's evidence on what their illegal activity was. It had something to do with drugs. We also heard that perhaps she may have attempted to set Greg up to be murdered. The police are not sure exactly why Cindy was targeted, but that morning, Nadine, Greg, and his new girlfriend, Teresa Baker, drove to a local motel where Cindy Bailey was staying. Nadine had been up all night drinking, may have been taking some drugs. They asked Miss Bailey if she wanted to go partying with them, and she said yes, so she got in the car with them. As the four drove towards Gans, Oklahoma, the mood in the car turned nasty. Nadine accused the frightened girl of plotting to have her son, Greg, killed. Cindy denied the rumor. Nadine Smith told Cindy Bailey that she would never see Cherokee County again. She put on some black gloves and began to choke Cindy Bailey. She took a knife and stuck it into the neck. She had twisted the knife while it was stuck in her flesh in an attempt to torture her. The group drove Cindy to the home of Nadine's ex-husband, Jim Smith. There, Nadine held Cindy Bailey in a chair at gunpoint, taunting her by pointing the gun at her head. Jim Smith attempted to talk her out of it. He talked to Greg and said, Greg, you've got to stop your mother. Jim Smith left the house, but Greg and Teresa stayed behind with Nadine. She shot Cindy Bailey. Nadine handed the gun to her son, Greg. While he was reloading the gun, she jumped on the neck of Cindy Bailey. Nadine was essentially out of control. What happened was an act of pure defensive anger about this woman being threatening to her son. Nadine fired several more shots into the body of Cindy Bailey. The young woman was shot five times in the chest, twice in the head, and once in the back before she finally died. Nadine put the gun in Cindy Bailey's hand, and they left. 
The body of Cindy Bailey was found by Jim Smith and his neighbors when Jim returned to the house. I have had several homicides in the while I was sheriff, but this was one of the worst. There was blood all over the house. Miss Smith and her son fled the area and they were later uh, captured in the Tahlequah area. The mother and son denied everything, but Teresa Baker cracked under interrogation. It wasn't too long before she told us what had happened. Nadine was charged with murder in first degree, and so was her son, Greg. Nadine Smith went on trial in December 1982. Prosecutor Michael Daffin felt confident he would get her the death penalty. Their defense was to blame Teresa Baker. It was Teresa who did it all. There was overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Nadine Smith was the one who was giving orders. She was mean Nadine. Nadine also had uh, a history of brain injury. She had this problem of controlling emotions when provoked. But evidence of Nadine's mental health problems was never presented in her defense. And the most damning piece of evidence for the prosecution was provided by Nadine herself. A letter that Nadine Smith had written to her son, Greg. In it, she says, if they ask if I jumped on her throat, it wasn't me, it was Teresa. The note was coaching Greg as to what to say or not to say. It was very incriminating. As each juror read that note, they would pass it on to the next juror, and they would sit there and glare at Nadine. I knew, without a doubt, they were going to convict her, and they did. In later appeals, Nadine claimed the trial was flawed because she shared the same lawyer as her son. The lawyer would make decisions protecting the son and at the, to the detriment of the mother. Greg Smith was tried in Muskogee County and was sentenced to life in prison. I fully feel that Mrs. Smith got what she deserved. I defy anybody to read the transcript of this trial and not be outraged by what Nadine Smith did to Cindy Bailey. The death penalty was the appropriate penalty. Nadine Smith was put on Oklahoma's death row, where she lived for six years before being joined by Marilyn Plants in 1989. Marilyn Plants was born in 1960. She grew up in a country town near Oklahoma City. She was always a fairly quiet, reserved kind of girl. At the age of 16, Marilyn left secondary school and married 22-year-old Jim Plants. The couple soon had two children, Trina and Chris. Jimmy and Marilyn had a perfect marriage. You never seen them fight. Jim Plants worked in the Daily Oklahoman press room since he was a teenager, and he was working nights. He was a wonderful father and husband. Just a real outgoing, busy all the time guy. Absolutely loved his kids. But Jim Plants had no idea what his wife of 11 years was up to while he was at his night job. She had been leaving the kids at night and going out. 27-year-old Marilyn was leading a double life, partying with a younger crowd. She met Bryson about spring of 1988, started uh, dating him beginning of August. She's talking about getting rid of her husband. Our anniversary's next week. Oh, oh, 11, 11 years. Clifford Bryson was 18 years old and had a police record for petty crimes. Bryson was easily manipulated. She bought him clothes and she bought him alcohol. The lovers hatched several plots to kill Marilyn's husband. Bryson recruited a friend to help with the murder, 18-year-old Clinton McKimball. On the night of the 26th of August, Marilyn gave the go-ahead. Marilyn decided that uh, they were going to kill him tonight. Hand each of them a baseball bat. At four o'clock that morning, while the children were sleeping, 
the three conspirators waited for Jim Plants to come home from work. And I hear the key in the door. Jim was whistling as he came in, has his groceries. They come from behind with the two baseball bats and attacked him. And they just hit him a bunch of times in the head. Marilyn stayed in her bedroom until Jim had been beaten unconscious. She comes out and says, that doesn't look like any accident. It was quite a bloody scene at that point. So Marilyn says, you're going to have to, to burn him. Bryson and McKimball drove Jim in his pickup truck to a secluded area where they staged a fiery accident. They poured gasoline on him and in the interior of the car and lit it. As they're driving away, McKimball says he looks back. He sees Jim Plants raise up. He raised up, opened the driver's door, stuck out his foot before he was consumed by the flames, fell back over and, and perished. One hour later, Jim Plants' vehicle was still burning when the police arrived at the scene. Foul play was immediately suspected. They could tell by the intensity of the fire. Jimmy's dead. Jim Plants' family rushed to comfort his wife, Marilyn, but the police were already suspicious of the young widow. She just was just odd. She wasn't giving them the impression that they expect a wife to have after losing her husband. When Women on Death Row continues. It was cold and calculated. It makes you think if this is not a death penalty case, what is? And later, a clemency appeal is really an appeal for mercy. On the 26th of August, 1988, 33-year-old family man, Jim Plants, was savagely beaten and burned to death. The police didn't know who'd committed the horrific murder, but they had suspicions about Plants' 27-year-old wife, Marilyn. Investigators noticed some warning signs. She kept changing her story, which is a classic sign of... When the police searched her home, they found chilling evidence of Jim Plants' final hours. The carpet was soaked with blood. I found two baseball bats. Both of them contained blood. Marilyn was arrested on the 29th of August and charged with first-degree murder. Her accomplices, Clifford Bryson and Clinton McKimball, were picked up a day later. When they told us Marilyn was a suspect, we all thought, it can't be. She wouldn't do something like that. Not Marilyn. I mean, she was like a sister. The motive for this particular crime was money. Marilyn had him increase his insurance policy from $30,000 to approximately $300,000. It was cold and calculated. It makes you think, if this is not a death penalty case, what is? The trial began in March 1989. Despite the defense team's requests, the judge ordered that Marilyn Plants and her teenage boyfriend, Clifford Bryson, be tried together. Clinton McKimball, their accomplice, agreed to give evidence against them in exchange for life in prison. Her defense was, the guys did it, she wasn't involved. It was total denial. Maybe she wasn't the one holding the bat or the can of gas, but she instigated it. Marilyn Plants was transferred to death row, joining Nadine Smith. Another woman, Wanda Jean Allen, would be locked up with them just one month later. Wanda Jean Allen grew up in the uh, northeast part of Oklahoma City. Her family situation was probably not, definitely not the best in the world. A lot of drug abuse, a lot of domestic violence. Wanda Jean had a very explosive temper. She would just go off just at any time. Age 21, Wanda Jean Allen was involved in a shooting death. She killed a woman and had pled guilty to manslaughter. Wanda served four years in prison for the manslaughter of Dietra Pettis. While behind bars, she met a fellow inmate, Gloria Leathers. After they were both released, they actually were lovers. Living together. They had a stormy relationship. 
We had been out to the house on numerous occasions because of fights. On the afternoon of the 1st of December, 1988, Wanda Jean and Gloria had another heated argument. A dispute arose over Gloria's welfare check. Apparently, Wanda wanted possession of it, and Gloria did not want her to have it. The dispute continued back at the couple's home. Gloria Leathers had decided to leave Wanda Jean that day. Gloria's mother had come over to, to help Gloria move out. Wanda was not happy about this and told her that if she couldn't have her, no one could have her. Gloria and her mother got in the car. Wanda Jean followed them in her vehicle. Uh, they pulled up in front of the police department. Wanda Jean had a gun with her. She confronted Gloria in the parking lot of the police department and shot her once in the stomach. A police officer heard the gunshot. He saw Wanda Jean Allen running with a gun in her hand. She jumped in her vehicle and took off. Laura Lewis suffered a severe gunshot wound to the abdomen. 29-year-old Wanda Jean eluded the police for four days until they received an anonymous tip-off. She was arrested 70 miles south of Oklahoma City. Just before we started the official interview, I advised her of her rights again for the second time. And I told her, we received a call from Mercy Hospital, and Gloria's passed away. She died about 20 minutes ago. You want me to get you some tissue? I think Wanda Jean Allen had a lot of remorse uh, about the crime. <laughs> she loved Gloria. Wanda Jean was charged with murder, and lawyer Robert Carpenter was hired to defend her. State prosecutors then announced that they would seek the death penalty for Allen. Bob Carpenter had never tried a death penalty case before. He asked the judge to recuse himself from the case, and the judge refused. Her defense at trial was self-defense. She argued that uh, Gloria had a garden rake and struck her with it. I asked her, was she going to come back home, you know? What happened? She had got out with the thing in her hand. So I opened the door and I got the gun. I wasn't going to let her hurt me. She tried to bring up something about a hand rake. We didn't see one in the car. According to later appeals, Wanda Jean's lawyer made a crucial error during the trial. Wanda Jean had an IQ of 70, so she was borderline mentally retarded. Her attorney did not even introduce into the trial her mental impairments. He wasn't able to hire a mental health expert. Wanda Jean had frontal lobe brain damage, but a jury never got to hear those things. Wanda Jean Allen was imprisoned on death row next to Nadine Smith and Marilyn Plants. My duty was to visit the death row inmates on a weekly basis. When I met Wanda Jean, it was a very cold reception at first. Into the fourth year, something changed with Wanda. She was reading her Bible and she said, what does this mean and what does this mean? The prison chaplain, Don Duncan, ministered to the women on death row for years. Nadine looked like a nice grandmother, a very pleasant, polite person. Marilyn had this shy personality about her. And Wanda was kind of the humorous one. And we would study the scriptures. We never talked about their crime. Very seldom would we talk about their families. It was very painful for them to talk about their children and what they had done. In September of 2000, a local pastor baptized all three of them. They became a very close group to the point that they changed it. This is not death row anymore. This is life row. But that same year, the courts denied the final appeals of Wanda Jean Allen, Marilyn Plants, and Nadine Smith. The women of Oklahoma's death row had run out of time. We began to receive word that in the very near future, all three would be executed. Wanda Jean Allen was scheduled to be executed first. A clemency hearing would be her final opportunity to escape the death penalty. 
clemency hearings are, are highly charged proceedings. We are arguing on behalf of the state to carry out the sentence that was imposed by the jury. The defendant is trying to convince them to spare her life. A clemency appeal is really an appeal for mercy. It's not a retrial. Local minister Robin Myers appealed to the clemency board on Wanda Jean's behalf. I simply said, Wanda Jean has become a really good person in prison. She knows what she did was wrong. We just want to try to get her life in prison without parole. The defense team also asked that Wanda Jean's mental impairment be considered. But the state argued that she knew enough to be accountable. She had a job. She functioned in society. She paid the bills. She could function just fine. I think she knew right from wrong. Wanda Jean was invited to address the clemency board and make a plea in her own words. She sat down and, in my opinion, the wheels came off. She couldn't articulate what she wanted to say. She was extremely emotional. It was very difficult for her to speak. She apologized to the families of the victims. I'm very ashamed and very sorry about what I did. When Wanda Jean was denied clemency, I lost all hope. She was devastated. Just no way to, to describe it except she was devastated. When Women on Death Row continues. Wanda Jean really believed right up to the very end that her life was going to be spared. She deserved just as much mercy as she had shown him, which was absolutely not. And later. You don't want to believe that that kind of evil exists. In 2001, three women were on death row in Oklahoma. Nadine Smith, Marilyn Plants, and Wanda Jean Allen. Their appeals had been exhausted, and Wanda Jean Allen was about to become the first woman to be executed in Oklahoma since statehood in 1907. There was a big protest that, that had been planned. The largest anti-death penalty march that's ever occurred in the United States. The executions take place in McAllister, Oklahoma, at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. The Supreme Court was asked one last time to stay the execution. They did not. Her lead attorney, Steve Presson, had to say to Wanda Jean on the phone, we cannot help you anymore. There was a long, long pause, silence, on the other end of the phone. Because Wanda Jean really believed right up to the very end that her life was going to be spared. Wanda Jean Allen was escorted to the execution chamber on the evening of the 11th of January. It's kind of somber mood all over the prison. If the inmates well respected uh, at the time of the execution, a lot of the offenders on death row, they'll start banging on the door. That's their way of saying goodbye. Approximately 30 minutes before the execution, They'll start securing the offender on this gurney. Most families want to witness executions because it's the last thing that they can physically do for their loved one. 26 members of the victim's families came to McAllister to witness the execution of Wanda Jean Allen. We walked into this room. Those blinds opened up. And you could see Wanda Jean laying on, on the gurney. I'm at the head of the gurney. I'm probably 18 inches from her head. And we were able to talk with each other. For the warden asked her, uh, do you have a last statement? She raised her head up and said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The first drug that is administered puts them to sleep. The second drug will stop the diaphragm, uh, and, and then the third drug will um, kill the heart and the brain. Once the process has begun, it, it usually takes about five minutes. We have a team on standby 
to save the offender for any last, last minute stays. She raised her head up, looked over at us, stuck her tongue out, and that was it. She was gone. Wanda Jean Allen did not deserve to be executed, in my opinion, because no one deserves to be executed from a moral standpoint. That didn't balance the scales of justice. Not a single member of the victim's families said, please execute Wanda Jean. Justice was served in Wanda Jean's case. She had killed before. She's the type of person that the death penalty is intended for. Marilyn Plants was scheduled to follow Wanda Jean Allen to the death chamber. Her accomplice, Clifford Bryson, had already been executed in June 2000. After we gave Marilyn her 30-day notice, she said, Chaplain, can you teach me how to study the Bible for myself? The clemency hearing for Marilyn Plants took place on the 17th of April 2001, two weeks before her execution date. She said, I take the full responsibility of what happened to Jim. I felt like she deserved just as much mercy as she had shown him, and which was absolutely not. Marilyn's daughter, now age 21, pleaded for her mother's life to be spared. Marilyn Plants's uh, attorneys pushed the argument of, well, you know, this is the only parent these kids have. Therefore, grant her clemency. I was hurting for Trina. Trina didn't want her mother to be executed. She said, Chaplain, I want you to read these scriptures. The rich man and Lazarus in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. The inmate has up to two minutes to make a last statement. I try to prepare families um, for the fact that they may not even acknowledge uh, the victim or the victim's family members. She knew we were there, but she didn't say anything to us. I began to read the scriptures that she asked. The doctor is at the end of the gurney. Whenever that monitor shows that there is no longer life, he will stand up and pronounce her dead. Marilyn died long before I finished those two short passages, but he did not stand up. He let me read those. Until the day that they executed her, I harbored that hatred and that, that passion to, to see justice done. And when they finally had the execution, to me, it was over. It's done. I have forgiven Marilyn, because you've got to forgive to move on with your life. But I won't ever forget. It'll always be with me. I think about my brother all the time. No, I couldn't forgive her. After Marilyn's execution, I said, I no longer can do this. I began to have nightmares. Nadine Smith was now the only woman on Oklahoma's death row. Nadine thought that God had saved her for the last to help Wanda Jean and Marilyn through their executions. Nadine's lawyer, Gregory Pichet, faced the clemency board in a last ditch effort to save her life. I wanted to try to provide an explanation. How did this person come to do an act that was so violent and so inhumane? Nadine was very protective of her son, Greg. It resulted in an outrageous act. She was deeply remorseful about the pain that she'd caused. Nadine chose not to attend her own clemency hearing. She was absolutely convinced that there was no option for clemency. She had a lot less faith than, uh, than we did. She was right, we were wrong.
on the 4th of December 2001, Nadine Smith walked the same route to the execution chamber as her friends Marilyn Plants and Wanda Jean Allen. We were given an opportunity to see her for the last time before the execution. We talked about uh, she was going to watch this football game from heaven. She was going to meet her Lord. She said her final words. She expressed her remorse to the family. Don Duncan had resigned as prison chaplain, but he kept a personal vigil as the woman he'd counseled for years was executed. I can remember looking at the clock about 20 minutes after, and I knew it was over with. Oklahoma has chosen to have the death penalty as a punishment. The people of Oklahoma voted that, and that's what they have chosen. We kill people to prove how wrong it is to kill people. We're not just killing a murderer. We're dealing with a human being. If you're a person of religious faith, you believe every human being has value and worth. What about the value of the victim's life? Isn't that worth something? It's a process that leaves a lot of victims with a lot of grief. Nobody. Nobody comes out clean. When you talk about justice being served for victims, there's going to be as many answers as you ask the question. For most family members that I work with, there is justice. The death penalty shows that we do have a lot of respect for human life, um, in that we do give the ultimate penalty when you take another person's life. We spend a lot of resources, money, arguing whether somebody lives or dies. I think that there's a better way to spend that money and maybe look at putting it back into the, the communities that raise Wanda genes. This is a case that cries out for the death penalty because of the cold, calculated nature of these... Female serial killer. She was bold, very bold in her crimes. Here's a woman engaged in a very methodical plan to kill for money. Women tend to commit different crimes than men. They tend to kill someone close to them, family member, friend. Primary example of that is Judy Buenoano in Florida. You never would have thought Judy was a dangerous person, where actually she was one of the most dangerous women I've ever come in contact with. Judy Buenoano was born Judius Ann Luelti in 1943. Her mother died when she was two, and her father remarried. She was raised in difficult circumstances. There were five stepbrothers and a stepmother. She was very much abused in that family constellation. Judy claimed that she was beaten, starved, and forced to work like a household servant. By the age of 14, she'd had enough. She completely lost it through hot grease over her brothers. She was taken to a detention center. She would never return home. Judy graduated from a girls' reform school and two years later gave birth to a son, Michael. Michael's father was a mystery. She had him as an illegitimate child at 18. The young mother married an Air Force officer, James Goodyear, in 1962. The couple had two more children before Judy's husband was posted to Vietnam. He came home in July 1971. By September of 1971, he died from mysterious circumstances. She was the loving wife at his bedside. She collected life insurance. That became an aha moment for Judy. By having an insurance policy on someone, she could get the money she needed. Judy spent the next several years with a boyfriend, Bobby Joe Morris. She had a very charismatic personality and uh, kind of dominating, especially with men. When they moved to Colorado in 1977, things took a turn for the worse. She started giving him arsenic, and it started making him sick. And within a year, Bobby Joe Morris is in the hospital. 
dying of the same strange symptoms. She would bring containers of, of Hawaiian punch right under the noses of the nurses and the doctors. Bobby Joe Morris died in January 1978. His doctors were mystified, and an autopsy failed to spot the arsenic in his body. Very often, pathologists don't check for arsenic. You usually would never get arsenic by mistake. It has to be given to you. Three separate life insurance policies had been taken out on Bobby Joe Morris a couple of months before he died. With the insurance money, Judy bought a home near Pensacola and started a new life. She legally changed her last name to Buenoano, Spanish for good year. She had a very nice house in an area called Whisper Bay. Her oldest son, Michael, dropped out of high school in the 10th grade and joined the army. Michael came home for a holiday leave she starts giving them the arsenic. It didn't kill them. It just made them really, really sick. With heavy metal poisoning, and arsenic is a heavy metal, you start getting different kinds of uh, symptoms. And one of those symptoms is paralysis. He ended up being a paraplegic. He had um, leg braces on. Within months, Michael's health had deteriorated, and he had to leave the army. He was discharged into the care of his mother. The very day that he came home from the army, Judy arranges to go on a fishing trip with Michael and the younger brother, James. They load up the canoe, strap a lawn chair into the middle of the canoe, and they put Michael in the lawn chair. This here is the uh, East River, and uh, actually right over there is where Judy had put the canoe in. Judy and her two sons paddled up the East River. The police could only speculate about what happened next. She's out there on the river, she has the sons, and you know, one drowns. The canoe had capsized. Michael, wearing these braces, went straight to the bottom. The fishermen found Judy and James in the water uh, next to the overturned canoe. The debris was all around the canoe. The sandwich bags were floating, the cooler was floating. Judy apparently said, my other son, Michael, fell out of the canoe somewhere up there. About a quarter of a mile, Michael's body was found at the bottom of the river. The police asked Judy how the boat had capsized. There were several stories. One was that she had hit a submerged log and that caused the canoe to tip over. One was that they were fishing and the the line got caught in a tree. And then there was a snake uh, that was in the canoe at one point. I think she just dumped him. He sank like a rock, boom, straight down. Judy's younger son, James, who was also in the boat, claimed he had no memory of the incident because he'd been knocked unconscious. Michael's drowning was ruled an accident, and Judy cashed in multiple life insurance policies on her son. This windfall allowed her to set up a business in Pensacola. She had opened a Fingers and Faces nail salon. She'd take on a whole new identity. She was very much the actress and very good actress too. To act out emotional situations when she needs to while planning a cold-blooded killing is the hallmark of a sociopathic personality. Judy was a very evil person, a greedy person. She just wanted to be real important. The personality disorder I did see in her was narcissistic, which means that she thinks she can get away with what she does, that she's entitled to do what she does. In 1981, Judy found a new boyfriend, 34-year-old local businessman John Gentry. By the following year, she'd secretly taken out a $500,000 life insurance policy on Gentry. She began poisoning him with some orange citrus tabs. John started getting some very strange stomach symptoms. Gentry stopped taking the pills, and according to him, this infuriated Judy. Six months later, she surprised her boyfriend with happy news. She blurts out to him that, I've just seen the doctor, and I'm pregnant. She had him convinced that they you know, should get married. Judy was hosting a party that evening at a local restaurant for one of her salon employees. She suggested John drive his own car and meet her there. She told him exactly where to park and don't park anywhere else. 
Toward the end of the evening, Judy says to John, Go get some champagne, and I'll meet you at the house. And that's when John walked outside, got in his vehicle, turned the key on, boom. Five sticks of dynamite in the trunk of his car had ignited. Amazingly, he doesn't die. Detective Ted Chamberlain investigated the case with his partner, Rick Steele. They asked the injured man who might want him dead. Gentry had no idea, but he mentioned being ill a few months earlier after taking vitamins provided by Judy. When we had him tested, the FBI said it was paraformaldehyde. Paraformaldehyde is a chemical that is used for cleaning utensils in beauty salons. The police then discovered the half million dollar insurance policy on Gentry's life and knew they were on the right track. A search of the Buenoano home yielded evidence from the bedroom of Judy's teenage son. The same kind of wire that was found in his room was the wire that was used to run the bomb to the taillights of the car. The police suspected that Judy's son or another accomplice had planted the bomb at her request. They also found it interesting that Judy had booked an upcoming holiday without her fiance. She had booked a world cruise. Mr. Gentry, her future husband, was not amongst the reservations. The failed murder attempt opened up Judy's life to police scrutiny. They started looking into her past uh, loved ones. And what the detectives unearthed was chilling. People around her kept dying. There was a plan here of Judy Buonoano to kill family members for insurance proceeds. When Women on Death Row continues... You started to see Judy breaking. You don't know what happened in that canoe. And later... They're buried alive. It's the worst thing I've ever seen as a prosecutor. She was an active participant. In Pensacola, Florida, 40-year-old Judy Buenoano was suspected by police of the 1983 attempted murder of her boyfriend, John Gentry. Further investigation of Judy's past revealed that several people close to her had died under mysterious circumstances, including her son, Michael. Detectives believed they'd found a serial killer. Judy didn't like me from the very beginning because I think Judy knew that I was on to her. Chamberlain had a reputation as the dogged investigator. If you'd done something, you didn't want Ted Chamberlain investigating. He started getting court orders to exhume bodies, and that's when things really begin to unravel. The bodies of Judy's husband, James Goodyear, her boyfriend, Bobby Joe Morris, and her son, Michael, were exhumed. Michael, even though he was a drowning accident, had heavy doses of arsenic in his system. Her first husband, James, arsenic in his system. Bobby Morris, same thing, arsenic. Judy Buenoano was arrested in July 1983. Her teenage son was also arrested as an accomplice to the bombing of Gentry's car, but was later acquitted at trial. Judy was tried first for the drowning of her son, Michael. Ted Chamberlain recreated the canoe accident to show the jury how the facts pointed to murder. I overturned my canoe. Things started floating down, but everything got caught. All the debris couldn't have floated down and ended up here where she was. The prosecutor surmised she had gone up river with Michael pitched him out, and simulated the accident. In October 1984, Judy stood trial again, this time for the attempted murder of John Gentry. She was convicted. Her third trial began one year later. She faced the death penalty for the 1971 murder of her husband. It was pretty much the talk of the town. The label Black Widow was affixed to Judy. She was very stoic, very silent, and very angry. You started to see Judy breaking, glaring at the witnesses on the stand. You don't know what happened in that canoe. That's right, but you sure gave the jury a real good show of what I did. And my God, you don't know you okay, weren't there. Judy's dramatic denials on the witness stand could not outweigh the scientific evidence of arsenic poisoning. The only real evidence were the actual bodies themselves. 
The silent testimony of the dead were her biggest witnesses against her. Judy Buenoano spent 12 years on Florida's death row. News reporter Sue Strawn had been a regular customer at Judy's salon before the crimes were uncovered. Sue was the only person to whom Judy gave an interview before her execution. I, even at that point, had a hard time seeing her as a murderer. There was that softness. She could pull you in very easily. I think they just didn't have any other leads whatsoever. They never investigated anybody else. I've always thought, why? Why did you single me out? She denied ever, ever killing anyone. I think she truly believed that she was innocent, that she really didn't do these things. Conviction said that you pushed him out of a new. And who said that? What said witness that. said that? What witness said that? The prosecution said that. No witness said that at all. The sociopath would not admit guilt. They will not let you have the satisfaction. I did not murder my son. It was a tragedy. I've never lived it. I almost lost both of my sons that day. Judy said she was ready to face the execution. She was tired. And truly, I, I think she was ready to go. Don't be fooled by me. Don't be fooled by the face I wear. For I wear a thousand masks. Her head was shaved. They sat her down in the chair. Um, you know, the fellows strapped her in. Masks I'm afraid to take off, and none of them are me. They put the mask over. They asked if she had any last words, and she just shook her head, no. Pretending is an art that's second nature to me, but don't be fooled. For God's sake, don't be fooled. She was the first and last woman to die in Florida's electric chair. I didn't hurt for Judy. I hurt for her family. Judy's children defended their mother to the end. Personally, I don't believe in the death penalty. But of all the death sentences, hers was probably the most deserved. Was justice served? I still wrestle. You want to see the good in every person. You don't want to believe that that kind of evil exists. A few years after Judy Buenoano's execution, Florida's female death row lay empty. But a shocking crime would soon give the state a new condemned woman. In the summer of 2005, the city of Jacksonville, Florida, reeled from a horrific double murder. The Sumners were kidnapped from their home they were driven out 40 miles and buried alive. It's the worst thing I've ever seen as a prosecutor. The police followed a trail across state lines in a cat and mouse game that eventually led to the capture of four young vicious killers, three men, and at the center of it all, a 23-year-old woman called Tiffany Ann Cole. Cole knew the Sumners. Tiffany Cole's parents were friends with the Sumners, and she ultimately was involved in their murder. This was a death penalty case because of the gruesome, heinous nature of the killing. But what role did Tiffany play in the shocking crime? Tiffany Cole tried to say that she was just a minor participant in the crime. And was it enough to justify a place on Florida's death row? Tiffany Cole was no angel, and she was not uh, an innocent bystander. Tiffany Ann Cole was born on the 3rd of December, 1981. She grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. She had a pretty normal upbringing. She had a mother and a father that loved her. Tiffany played in the band in school and was a cheerleader. But as a teenager, Tiffany went off the rails. She dropped out of secondary school and got mixed up with drugs. Tiffany admitted that she used and sold 
cocaine. In 2005, her father was diagnosed with cancer. Tiffany took care of her terminally ill father. A retired couple, Reggie and Carol Sumner, lived next door. They also helped Tiffany's father. Carol and Reggie had just found each other. They were close friends in high school and reunited after all of those years and got married shortly thereafter. They were both in very poor health. Carol had cancer, had gone through some chemotherapy. Reggie had horrible diabetes. The Sumners decided to move to Jacksonville to enjoy their retirement. They were going to spend the rest of their time together, uh, enjoying what time they had despite their health difficulties. Just before the Sumners moved, they sold their car to Tiffany Cole, the daughter of their neighbor. It would prove to be a fatal connection. In May 2005, 23-year-old Tiffany was out with friends in Myrtle Beach when she met Michael James Jackson. Jackson stole her cocaine and money from a hotel room. So that's how these two met, and I guess Tiffany Cole fell in love with the man that robbed her. Michael Jackson was 23 years old. I would use the word sociopath. He was someone who fancied himself as a player. He had never really held down a job. Tiffany and Michael spent the next month together, partying and taking road trips. But the high life didn't last long. Tiffany Cole and her boyfriend had run out of money. In June, they drove to Jacksonville, Florida, to visit Michael's friend, Alan Wade. Tiffany knew that Reggie and Carol Sumner, the retired couple who'd sold her their car, now lived in Jacksonville. The Sumners told Tiffany that if you ever need a place to stay, then your, our home is open to you. Reggie and Carol Sumner let the young couple stay overnight in their new home. During the visit, Tiffany found out that the Sumners had made some money through the sale of their old home. It was Tiffany's understanding that there was maybe seventy-five dollars to $100,000 profit from the sale. Jackson saw that the Sumners were very old and feeble and could not defend themselves. A plan began to hatch then. Jackson decided to bring his friend, 18-year-old Alan Wade, in on the plot. Michael said, I I've got these easy targets, they've got money. He, along with Tiffany Cole and Alan Wade, decided they would abduct these people and kill them in order to get their bank accounts. A fourth accomplice was recruited by Alan Wade, his best friend, Bruce Nixon, also a teenager. A couple days before the crime, they went out to a deserted area near the Florida-Georgia border. Jackson, Wade, and Nixon dug a six foot by four foot grave. Tiffany Cole held the flashlight while the hole was dug. The scene was laid out and all they needed now was the victims. When women on death row continues. That dirt is rising, their chest is compressing and they're buried alive. This crime could not have happened without her. In July 2005, 23-year-old Tiffany Cole and three young men plotted to commit a brutal home invasion robbery in Jacksonville, Florida. Their intended victims were a retired couple, Reg... Yeah. ...dug a six-foot by a four-foot grave where the Sumners were going to be placed. Tiffany Cole drives them to the home. Bruce Nixon and Alan Wade get out of the car, and Michael Jackson stays in the car with her. Mr. Nixon and Mr. Wade knocked on the door, indicating they need to use the phone. The Sumners let them in. According to court testimony, after a few minutes, Michael joined the intruders inside the Sumner home. Bruce Nixon and Alan Wade tied up the Sumners. They duct taped them, put them in the trunk of their own car. They drove off in the dead of night. Alan and Bruce drove the Sumners car with the couple locked in the boot. Tiffany and Michael followed behind. Tiffany waited by the roadside while the three men drove the Sumners car into the woods. The way to get money from the Sumners was to make sure that they weren't around to call the police when their bank accounts were being drained. Jackson and Wade forced the Sumners into this pre-dug grave, obtained their ATM bank information. They shoveled dirt on them. Slowly as that dirt is rising, their chest is compressing and it's becoming harder and harder for them to breathe. As the dirt reaches their mouth level, they end up inhaling the dirt uh, and, and they're buried alive.
everything that happened at their death scene. It's really, uh, it's unimaginable, but it happened. The killers wasted no time before cashing in on their crime. They were accessing the ATM cards at every opportunity. Tiffany Cole actually goes back with Mr. Wade after the murder. They take more of the Sumner's property, jewelry, computers. And uh, Tiffany Cole was the one who was pawning the items for additional money. The Sumner's daughter, Rhonda, tried to get a hold of her mom and, and, and just simply could not get her on the phone and knew something was wrong uh, and called the police. Police investigators feared for the safety of the missing couple. The Sumner's car had been found abandoned, and someone was accessing their bank account. They had pictures of Michael um, using the Sumner's ATM. Also visible on ATM surveillance cameras was the hire car Tiffany and Michael were driving. As the police worked to identify the mysterious cash point user, they received a surprising phone call from someone claiming to be Reggie Sumner. Jackson, believing that the ATM card had been shut off, called into the sheriff's office pretending to be Reggie Sumner and asking the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office to turn on his ATM card. We tried to go to the ATM, but they definitely is saying unable to process and gave me the receipt. And if they contact the bank, I mean, I'm a diabetic and she's got, like, she's got cancer and everything and we take like, a lot of medication. It was quite obvious to the sheriff's office this was not Reggie Sumner. This was not a 61-year-old frail man. Detective Meacham asked to speak to Carol. Michael Jackson gets Tiffany Cole on the phone. Is this Carol? Yes, sir, it is. You doing all right? Mm-hmm. Just really tired. I understand. <laughs> I understand that you may have some health problems. Mm-hmm. Cancer. Cancer? And liver. The authorities trace the call to Jackson's mobile phone. Police discover the phone call to Triangle rent a car A Mazda RX-8 was recently rented to a Tiffany Cole in addition, each cash point transaction left a virtual trail that revealed the criminals had crossed state lines and were now in South Carolina. On the 14th of July, Tiffany Cole, Michael Jackson and Alan Wade were arrested in a hotel in Charleston. Bruce Nixon was later apprehended at his home in McClenny. Nixon led detectives to the buried bodies of Reggie and Carol Sumner. In jail, Michael Jackson heard that Bruce Nixon had talked to the police. He took them to the grave site and everything. Oh, my God, man. He took them to the... Are you kidding me? It's right here in today's paper. It's Bruce right where the spot was at. Yes, dear. Bruce just killed us all. Tiffany confessed to her involvement to being the driver to being at the side of the roadway while the Sumners were being buried. Can anybody tell you Reggie and Carol were dead? Mm-mm. It was kind of like a situation that really wasn't talked about. And you didn't have anything to do with helping dispose of the bodies? Mm-mm. You can ask all them boys. That's one thing that I did not do. Who's got to deal with all this? Everybody. What was the purpose of it? To get the credit cards. What happened on July 8, 2005, frankly, is the most heinous murder I've ever been associated with. Those words buried alive just resonated in this community like very few other murders have. This was a death penalty case because of the gruesome, heinous nature of the killing, the fact that it was premeditated. And in Florida, if a crime is committed for a financial gain, that's considered an aggravator to lean toward the death penalty. Bruce Nixon turned state's evidence against the others. Michael Jackson was the first to go on trial. Lawyer Richard Kurtz defended him. Michael Jackson liked to talk. No, no, hell no, 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 listen, listen. No. This was the plan. Tiffany gonna go in the house, get him all comfortable, relaxed. He thought he could talk his way out of this, this crime. So you told Alan and Bruce to put gloves on before they went in the house? No, I, my words were, if you're gonna use this, don't leave no fingerprints. I had to work with what he was leaving me, and he wasn't leaving me much. I'm going to get some money out of the deal, you know what I'm saying? Sure. His central theme was I was a part of getting some money, a part of ATM withdrawals, but I had no idea that anybody was going to get hurt.
Tiffany Cole went on trial in October 2007. If prosecutors were successful, she would soon be the only female on Florida's death row. But would a jury condemn this young woman to death? You want to make sure that you don't have any jurors that are going to say, I believe the death penalty is appropriate, but I just can't do it because it's a woman. Tiffany Cole's defense team was trying to run kind of a two-pronged defense. Michael Jackson made me do it, and if you don't believe that, I never thought they were going to get hurt. I'm not going to say that, that Michael Jackson didn't have some influence. The point is, Michael Jackson never meets Reggie and Carol Sumner without Tiffany. She was the only one who knew the Sumners. This crime could not have happened without her. She was an active participant in all of this crime, beginning, middle, end. When somebody gets the death penalty, it's not a good day for anybody. It's right and it's appropriate, but all I think about at that moment is, is why are we even here? Why are the Sumners dead and why is this woman going to get the death penalty that she deserves? This never had to happen. Tiffany Cole is the only female on death row in Florida. It remains to be seen whether Cole will escape her death sentence, like Pam Barillo in Texas and Deborah Bracewell in Alabama. Most women sentenced to death 